And welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Faith and Victory Church. Glad to have you tonight and trust you'll be blessed and have a, uh, be a ministry to you and that you'll have a wonderful rest of the week at the same time. Glory to God. So uh, we just want to let everybody know that we're out there and we're going to mute my iPhone so that we can talk over myself. I don't need to hear myself two seconds later. <laughs> Hallelujah. But praise the Lord. And um, you know, thank you all for volunteering for this week. We appreciate y'all's help. And um, it'll, we'll, uh, just thank you. All righty. Um, to the church at Ephesus, and he's, he's wrapping up his, his address to them. And uh, he comes down and he goes through the armor of God. And then, then in verse 18, he goes, and praying always with all prayer or all manner of prayer, and supplication in the spirit, and watching there into what all person. Open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, um, for which I am an ambassador in bonds. That therein I may speak boldly, as I ought to speak. And so, you know, we've, we've been talking over the past few weeks about the different types of prayer. You know, prayer of intercession, prayer of thanksgiving, prayer of worship, prayer of adoration, prayer of uh, binding and loosing, the prayer of faith, um, you know, uh, see how far we go, but um, on, on this last thing that Paul says, because we wouldn't really be able to say this is a type of prayer, and you know, you probably fall into some categories here, but he said, and as for me, actually talks about the armor of God and praying, you know, with all prayer and supplication in the spirit for all saints. Um, the utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Uh, I, we need in the church to have an understanding that things just don't happen. You know? Um, you're just, you're not just a soul winner because you got, you know, you went to a soul winning seminar and you're running out and doing all the things they tell you to do. Their prayer has to go forth. There has to be breaking of the ground. There has to be preparation of the ground. Um, you know, I grew up in Eastern Carolina. I know they farm all over the country, but I grew up in Eastern Carolina in, in, in a, a very agricultural area. Uh, Pitt County was a, um, a very, um, tobacco-based uh, community, that, that county. Um, bright leaf tobacco, they grew tobacco all the time. They, did, they grew some other things. I mean, they grew corn, they grew soybean. <clears throat> and of course, as soybean got popular, they began to grow soybean and stuff like that. Um, and different things. But, you know, being around that farm environment, cucumbers, something that they grew. And we had a, a pickle processing plant in Aden for, the, for Mount Olive pickles. Lovely smell. Just, just a lovely smell. Uh, rather have that though than the um, hog farm smell, blowing your, blowing the wind your direction. <clears throat> but anyway, to, you know the, the process they went through. Uh, they didn't run out there with any of the anything they grew. They just didn't run out there to flat ground, you know, and just and start throwing seeds out. Okay, they're, they're, the ground, you know, over time in between heart, in between uh, seasons became hardened. Um, you know, weeds would start to grow in it. All, you know, all kinds of stuff happened um, to that ground. The first thing they did is they plowed it. They'd go out and plow the ground. Now, if, when they were smart, they, wrote, they, they crop rotated. They didn't grow tobacco in the same field year after year after year after year after year. They never had to let it rest. You grow something else in it, you know, let the soil you know, replenish. But, you know, that, that's the cycle of farming. <clears throat> but they plowed the ground. They got the ground ready for the seed. Okay? Um, we now like with tobacco, they have what they call seed beds. They, you know, if you've ever seen tobacco seed, it's it's the it's tiny. I mean, a, a little box would do 160 acres. There's so many little seeds in there, just um, just amazing. Um, but what they would do is that you you ride if you go down to Eastern Carolina and you see this, you'll know what it is. If you ride down to Eastern Carolina about this time of year, and you look over in the field and see a bunch of black plastic with tires on it old tires on it. It's tobacco seed bits. 
they get the plastics there to they let the sun warm the ground and get things starting to germinate. But they're all planted real close together in these little in these in these seed beds, and um, and then black of course the old old used tires on top of it to keep the plastic from blowing away. And um, so you go down there and you see and you'll see what well, that's tobacco beds. Well, you, you can know that's not going to be the tobacco. Well, what happens is sometime around May, you know that's all uncovered, taken off, and and you got li these little bitty. Uh, springlings, but I don't even know what they call them, but you know, starter plants. They've they've grown up a little bit, just a little bit, not very much. And they'll they'll take that, and they'll go in and they'll uproot all of that. And they, but now that's going on over here while the ground's getting ready. And see, a lot of times we're over here in the seed beds talking about, oh, we're, we're you know, uh, we're we're soul winners. We're going to do this. Yeah. See, you got preparation all set. You got to prepare yourself for the for the for the the whole process. Okay, all right. So when we're in church and we're learning and we're we're learning the things of God and you know we're 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 becoming more like the image of Christ, we're in the seed bed. Yet at the same time, we need to be preparing the field so we can plant those fields. All right. And so you know they would go out, they would take the tractor out, and they would plow all these huge amounts of fields while the seed beds are on. They go uproot that and and they go out, then they go out in the fields and. And they got to where they had automatics so they could put them in there and it would go down and, would, and you know, it put them down every so often in, in rows. And, um, you know, you'd have, you'd have four rows and then a, a, a tractor path. Because you, when you harvested the tractor, would go down the middle tractor path and you could harvest the two rows closest to the tractor. So that's why you had four because, you know, there was another tractor path over there. And so when you came around the end, you came back the other way and you caught the other two of that, that particular row over there and so forth as you went through the field. And, uh, and, and but they were planted more like, this far apart, so the leaves when they came out, they didn't hit. You know, they weren't overlapping and cutting off the sun. You know, whatever, maybe something like this or whatever. And um, but in the little fields, they were like this close. They were they were just right, right, okay. So they've got the field ready. That field had to be plowed. It had, well, what what what's the plow for? Um, bring getting a harvest in the kingdom. Prayer, praying that we'll open our mouth with boldness, that we're bold. We have to be bold. So that when we go out and we begin to speak the words of life, as we begin to plant the seeds of, uh, of revelation to people about Jesus being Lord, we need to have the boldness of God. Paul, as, 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 um, as learned as he was, as, as um, eloquent as he was, as he was studied, as, as studious and studied as he was, and with such a supernatural converse, a, a conversion, he still comes back and says, pray for me that I'll open my mouth with boldness. I mean, if anybody would be, this, this guy stood at the feet, I mean, held the, the, the uh, people's cloaks and coats as they stoned Stephen to death and was consenting unto the death of the first martyr of the church. And yet he comes back later after his wild conversion. Jesus knocking him off the horse. You know, I call it the Mr. T event, you know. Fool gets saved, you're going to hell now, you know. And... Um, I don't know that Jesus had a bunch of gold jewelry on and a mohawk or not, but anyway, <laughs> hallelujah. Um, Paul even prayed. Pray for me that, um, and, you know, he says, do all these prayers, but, and as for me, pray me that I'll open my mouth and, make, and, and, and speak with boldness, and make known the mystery of the gospel, and pray that, that I will, that I will uh, be bold and speak as I ought. He, want, he wanted that boldness. Um, and that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. He says, I'm an ambassador in bonds, but I need to be able to speak as I ought to speak. Um, we have all kinds of techniques for, for witnessing. You've got the Romans roadmap. You've got the four spiritual laws. You know, everybody comes up with something. You've got chick tracks. Dick, that's the hippie era. That's the hippie, hippie era witnessing chick tracks. All right, you know. Uh, then we're not talking about chicks like in girl chicks, you know, from that set era. We're talking about the name of the guy who did all these chicks. His last name was Chick, Chick Tracks, <coughs> and um, you know, Chick Tracks were everywhere. People, you know, they, and they were they were interesting. They were interesting, whatever. You know, the the babies with the six 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 on their forehead. I if you ever saw that one. You know, about the coming end times and that kind of stuff. And um, you know, but everybody has these these different things. One of the things we got to always remember, no matter what kind of technique, if you pick up the uh, um, 
Campus Crusade for Christ and the Four Spiritual Laws, or you pick up the Romans Road Map um, from the Baptist, and you, you pick up uh, whatever. The thing is, none of those methods are going to be effective if we have not first gotten the field ready. Okay, in, in our in our outreach, in our get, getting things ready, prayer. We have to go with prayer to prepare so that we can get a harvest. Okay? We need a harvest. And what did Jesus say? Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into his harvest. He said the fields, now, now see, and all this other stuff, when you use an analogy sometimes to, to explain something, they're not always going to line up with another analogy. He says the fields are already white to the harvest. In other words, mankind is ready. But the, the, Paul says I have, we have to have prayer to go before us. We've got to have prayer to prepare things. In other words, prepare the hearts of men. Get them ready. Get us ready so that when we, we go out there, we have the right wisdom and the right words to say. Okay? Now, we're not going to you know, and, and this is another thing. You know, Jesus did say, he said, you know, take no thought of what you'll say in the hour, for the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. Okay? Um, and that's, that, that is a problem when we come up with, you know, well, you've got to follow the, you know. Um, and and listen, I'm not knocking you this because these are all good things to get people witnessing. Okay? They're good, you know, they're a lot, you know, like uh, the Campus Crusade for Christ using the four spiritual laws. Th these, are, these are good tools to get people trained in witness, okay? But we, even with that tool, that tool is ineffective if it's not connected right. If you, get, you go get a, um, um, a power tool, if you don't connect it to the right power source, uh, like if you try to plug it into a 220 and it's a 110, you're going to cook something. You're not going to be effective. We have to... Um, get things right in our process of being prepared to be good witnesses. Okay? We do receive, go in Jerusalem and, and, and uh, tarry there until you be due with power from high. After that, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. Then you should be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and other most parts of the earth. There's, there's something about being in that place of, of preparatory prayer and getting things ready so that we can go out and be effective. Open our mouths with boldness, okay? Um, if you go into a tobacco field with a, with a uh, corn combine, you know what you're going to get? Shredded green stuff all over the fields. Now, I don't know, I don't know all the process of how the corn combine works. It, it's an amazing thing. They go into the field, it goes in, it's on stalks, the ears are in there, and, and, and grain comes out the back end. And it's, it's, it's getting that grain off of there and shooting that the back end into a, a shoot into a, tra a tractor trailer sliding alongside the combine. You do that with tobacco, you're just going to throw out a bunch of green muck. Okay? Uh, it, it, it's the wrong kind of tool for it. You know, if you use a wheat combine, the, you're just going to chop it all to pieces you know, out in the field. Okay? Um, the the uh, automatic harvester for tobacco has... has, has uh, some kind of belt thing on it that, that twists and it goes down the rows and it hits the leaves and knocks them and, 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 they, and they knocks them off and they fall into a conveyor belt and go back up to a basket in the back. Replacing the old-fashioned way of doing it with your hands. You would reach your hand around and, and snap them off, you know, and, and, and put them in a belt and they would go up. Or, or you used to stick them on your arm, walk over and put them on the cart, take them out of the mule. That's, that's the old days. You know, they truck with a mule. You would you'd get a bunch of leaves and you'd be and shove it, and then you walk over and put it on the cart and keep going. Because that mule just didn't stop. He just, he just rode. You had to keep up with him um, as it went down. As it went down the road. So you had four people, one on each row, with the mule over here and pulling the cart, and you had to keep up with it. And so, okay. But any other kind of harvester, you use a, a, a wheat harvester or a, a corn combine, anything in the field, a tobacco field to harvest with, and you're going to ruin it. So prayer gives us the right tool in that moment when we're, met, when we're witnessing people with the boldness that we need to do it. So Paul wants us to be praying about being effective and being bold in our ministry, making known the mystery of the gospel. Okay? Um, and not just kind of going and doing something because I'm supposed to be a witness, but I don't know how to be a witness. Yet. Well, I don't think anybody really knows how to be a good witness without the Holy Ghost. Okay, we need the Holy Spirit. We need Him working in us. We can, somebody can, we can go to every prayer. I mean, soul winning seminar on the planet. If we leave out this part, this prayer part, 
it's not going to be effective. Not, not like it should be. I, you might, yeah. Listen, you, you throw your line in the water enough, you're probably eventually going to hook something. Okay? I mean, you know, uh, if, you go, if you go to, the, of course, some people, they go to the, the, to the uh, rainbow trout farms and still can't catch anything in there. I'm not a fisherman, obviously. I mean, you know, they're, they're trained to bite anything you throw in there. And they, you know, be... Anyway, they all run. <clears throat> How can you not catch a fish in the rainbow trout farm? You know, they, they feed them on grain and give you grain to give them so they don't, you know, corn, so they'll come and eat it so they can clean you at $18 a pound or whatever. But the, the kids call them fish. Hallelujah. So. But Paul recognized, even after putting all the whole armor of God in these things, uh, and even after all the things he experienced, all the revelation he had, that it was required for him to be an effective witness that he needed boldness to make known the mystery of Christ. Amen? We need more people with boldness. And, and we're living in a society, we're not living in, a, in an America of 40 years ago, where even, you know, uh, sinners were, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, they were respectful of you witnessing it to them, you know. Well, yeah, I grew up in church, you know, and uh, now it's it's in your face. I, you know, you're pushing your stuff down my throat. I don't want to hear about it. Well, we can't let the, the work of the enemy, the darkness of the enemy, uh, dissuade us from obeying Christ. Okay? We can't let him do that. We're, we're called to preach the gospel. We're called to share Jesus with people. You know, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, we have a responsibility in the kingdom of God to win people to the Lord. But in that responsibility, we need to be equipped. When you're saved, you're equipped. That's like saying a baby was born, they're equipped to be a, 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 a um, nuclear engineer. Do you really want the baby working on the circuits you know, of a nuclear device? No. No, they'll put it in the mouth with their mouth and short circuit the thing and, you know, be cooked. Uh, and everybody around them for 300 miles. Okay? Um, so, even in the fact we're in the kingdom, we need, to, we need to have preparation time. Okay? So we need to be prepared. We need to have that preparation in our life. And Paul said that he wanted other people to pray for him. So we need to be praying for one another also. That they'll open their mouth with boldness, make known the mystery of Christ. I get to see on a daily basis the effects of a secular, humanist, godless educational system that is deliberately designed to remove God out of the dialogue. I re remember reading an article back in... Um, early 80s, and a professor from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, had said that the next most important um, emphasis of higher education is to remove the myth of God from the classroom. This is the 80s now, and they've, they've been working hard at it ever since. And they've been very effective. Because their minds are darkened. These are people who, have, you know, who, who think because they're highly, they're highly educated, and many of them are educated beyond their intelligence. They really are. I mean, you know, they just, you, you look at people and you listen to open their mouth and you're going, that's about the dumbest thing I've ever heard, but you've you got a Ph.D. <clears throat> educated beyond your intelligence, okay? You've got a lot of this, you don't have, you don't have any ap application with it. And um, or, or, or even worse is you never did anything, you just became a research person. Okay, you got your degree and went back, all you did was research. And never, never applied any of it. It was never applied. It was all theoretical. And you, you think you're brilliant because you've got a theory. Well, I can come up with a theory. Okay? All right? Um, Brother Higgins you say a theory was ignorance of, of ignorance on the subject under discussion. 
you, you had a little bit more than that. I can't remember exactly how you said something along the lines of ignorant. You know, the theory is the ignorance of um, ignorance on the subject that's under currently under discussion. You know, you just come up with a theory, the theory of evolution. They don't have any. They, they don't have any facts to prove evolution. It is a theory. Yet we teach in our schools as absolute fact, and it's a theory. But our kids are taught that it's fact. They're not taught. They can't be told. You know, can't be taught, taught uh, intelligent design. Get God out of the classroom. We're dealing with now second, third generations of this stuff going on. And we, you know, and, and so people are hardened. People are cold. They're, uh, dis they're disconnected from humanity. They're video gamers. They're Fortniteers, whatever that game is. I don't know anything about it, but it's, it's, they, live, they live addicted to Fortnite. Um, I mean, we, we've had fights at our school. We, I mean, tell them, we've had fights in the classrooms at our school over kids that hap something happened on Fortnite during the weekend. They're coming to school and fighting, fist fighting, because of something that happened on Fortnite over the weekend. So they're disconnected from humanity. They're disconnected from a reality. They live in alternate states. They live in alternate thinking. They live, and we are the anchor in the earth that's called to preach Jesus and to bring light into darkness. And, you know, I don't know if you've seen some of the video games. They're dark. And they're getting darker. Even the ones that aren't, you, you wouldn't consider dark now, were dark 20 years ago. I mean, they were, they were just, they, they were, just a darkness about it. Now, that's the norm. And the darker they get, the better. And we, we, we got kids who just, I mean, about the only thing I ever play that I that I do with a, a, a phone or a video game is uh, free sale. You know, because uh, it, it's, it's it's challenging to keep you know to keep the brain working a little bit. But even that, you just can't do that for so long. You're like, oh God, I'm okay. I've won 300 games in a row. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> um, but the darkness that we, we're dealing with. We're, so we're walking into darkness now. But we got to remember, we're light. So as we bring light, we expose the darkness. And that's why we get the blowback. We get the blowback because we expose the darkness. Uh, we, we, this past week, we had a hall sweep. In other words, uh, teachers were told as soon as the bell rings, lock your doors. Anybody that's not in the room is, is tardy. Because we had, we had kids have gotten where, you know, You'd have 60 kids in the hall after the bell rang and go into class like this. Okay, I can't do it quite that way because my pants aren't down low enough. <laughs> okay? Told one kid the other day he had it down here below his butt cheeks and he had on thin briefs. I said, man, pull your pants up. Nobody wants to see your butt cheeks. Yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, down, but down here. And... Uh, we're not allowed to wear, they're not allowed to wear hoodies in school and the tank, and pants are supposed to be up. And I, I come in, I went to the kid and I said, listen, you've got it backwards. I mean, you misread the thing. It's hoodies down and pants up, not hoodies up and pants down. <laughs> and uh, a lot of times I'll get F-bombed. Anyway, I do, you know. So we, we had, you know, uh, we locked the door. Next thing I know, I got two kids outside kicking, shaking, trying to tear the door off the hinges. Uh, at telling me to open the effing door and, you know, and all this kind of stuff and screaming, saying, let me in and cussing like a sailor. I mean, this is the norm that we, we see out there. Man. I mean, it's just all the time. I, I mean, I see girls. You see these, these, these some, some pretty little girl come along, walking down the hall with her friend and going, well, effing this and effing that. And you're like, I remember the day, you know, it, it, guys would cuss a little bit, but then the girls would never do it. And then you got, now girls got more, they, they don't have potty mouth. They got the sewage, uh, sewage plant mouth. You're like, this is the kind of thing that, that the world has been driving to get to, darkness. And so the reason those guys are mad, they got caught. They got caught, and they got locked out, and they, they were going to get written up, and, you know, and answer a certain number of write-ups, they're going to detention. Okay, they got caught, so they're mad, and that's why when we come with the light, you'll get blowback from people because 
The light is exposing the darkness. That spirit that's at work. So what are we going to do? We got to be praying that we're not going to back down and we're not going to yield. We're going to stay bold because we love people. See, the bottom line is we love people. You don't want them to go to hell. You want them delivered from darkness. You want them delivered from the power of darkness. You want them translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. You've got to know that you have to be bold even in the midst of the darkness that Satan will growl at you. And the spirit operating them will do that because he wants you to back off. So Paul said, and think about what Paul was dealing with. He was dealing with a very, he was dealing with the Roman society. The, um, you know, besides their gods, you know, which were basically the same, they were the Greek gods that they just, you know, transferred names on. Same, same group of people. Just had a different name because the Romans were better, they thought, anyway. You know? Um, but, they, you know, they, they, but, but besides that, Caesar was basically like a deity to them. Okay? And, um, you know, the, the preaching of the gospel was not a... Was not a um, embellished or accepted thing in society. Paul, um, I find it interesting where Paul wrote the strongest statements about homosexuality to was the church at Rome. The seat of homosexuality at the known world at that time. It was their method of birth control. Lesbianism and homosexuality was, you know, uh, Calamite lovers, b boys with adult men was it was not only accepted but practiced by the upper echelon of society. Homosexuality and lesbianism was um, was common, more than just common. It was it was normal in the society. And yet Paul writes to that church the things he wrote about men uh, uh, with men. And women with women, uh, men working with uh, working men with men working that which is unseemly, and women also call away in this dissimulation. Women with women, women, you know, and he goes on and rebukes that and says that God gave no to a reprobate mind to the church at Rome. It wasn't like he wrote it off to the, you know the church in Asia Minor or something like that. Rome, okay, the darkness, and you know, and uh, and and so we have all kinds of of things that. We, we deal with. I mean, in our school right now, there's all kinds of signs all over the place about you know, like the gay, lesbian, you know, the gay, straight alliance. Everywhere, all over the building. You know, going to be meeting, actually meet uh, sometime the next week. You know, you can't go up and put, you know, the, um, the, uh, the Christian, non-Christian alliance up. Well, you, you probably could, but, you know, you, you don't, you're going to get blowback back on that. We do have the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, but that's, you know that's that's a little bit different as far as you know the other thing. It's, it's not an in-your-face thing. It's it's bringing people together or just whatever. We deal with, and I, but I can tell you, I I deal with. It. I, I sometimes I look in their eyes and see when they're cussing me out. I see the darkness. Of the devil really is coming out. It's Satan operating through them. But they respond to me more worse than anybody in this on the staff. I mean, and there's, there we got, we've got kids, and I know they are. We, everyone's calling me like, I know they've got demons operating on them. They're doing drugs. Listen, this is, this, is, this is just where we are. You want to help these kids. You know, and I help them as much as I can within the confines of, of, of what I can do at the school. Okay? You know, we can't, we can't go in and evangelize and that kind of stuff. But we can love on them. And we, you know, we can, we can tell them that, you know, there's a plan for their life, and, you know, it's better than what they've got, and uh, there's a future for them. They have a future. You just can't talk about Jesus or God while you're doing it. But, you know, you can, talk to, you can tell them there's a, there's a future for your life. There's, there's something out there better than what you're living in, you know. And, and um, you know, over time, they find out you love them. <clears throat> and, um, and then they find out you're a pastor. Then, they, then they, they, they'll come talking to you about stuff. Now, I, don't, I don't walk around, you know, saying I'm Pastor Taylor. But somebody found out. They, now I got him in the hall. Hey, Pasta. <laughs> <Good one. laughs> usually say, "What's up, girl?" You know. <clears throat> but it, we, we we're dealing with darkness. We're dealing with gross darkness in the earth. We're dealing with people who are bound, and we are going to have to have boldness to to 
to live and deal with that and to win. We have to have. That's why Paul took here in this place, in this, in this letter. And you kind of, you know, he's kind of working towards his doxology to the church at Ephesus. Uh, and, and this may be, this, this is highly likely more of a circular letter than just the Ephesians. It's, um, it was probably written and then traveled in different things for the Laodicea and different things. But since we have Ephesus, we'll call it to the church. Because it, it did go to the Ephesus. We know that. So but coming to his doxology, he said, you've you got to pray for me that I'll be bold. Okay? That I will, that I, that I, you know. And what did he say? For which I am an ambassador in bonds. He's locked up. Writing, I'm in bonds. Pray for me, I'll be bold. I remember when Phil, you know, Phil Driscoll, you know, um, due to some things in, in his ministry, there were some mistakes made, and people did. He, they were charged with uh, embezzlement, you know, something embezzlement or mishandling of, of nonprofit funds, something along those lines. And he went to prison. He got people saved. He got inmates saved. He got jailers saved. He got all kinds of people saved. Uh, the, um, the, uh, Jailer that took him to the you know, the guard that took him to the gate to release him was crying because he had been, he had ministered so much to his life, you know. So he was bold in that place. Paul says, "I'm an ambassador in bonds. Pray for me that I'll speak with boldness as I ought to speak." He knows he's headed for for uh, our modern day gas chamber. He's going to be going to be beheaded or, or crucified. He was beheaded. Um, yet he wouldn't be bold to preach. In a, in a non-receptive society, in a non-receptive environment. Okay. We feel safe when we go do a, a, a crusade that's put on by churches. And I, I, listen, do not misinterpret that in any way. However, whatever method, whatever venue we could use to get the people, we want to get the people. Okay? But now we tend to want to leave all the soul winning to the evangelist. Let them stand behind a microphone and preach to the crowd and people get saved. And as many people as get saved that way, that's not how we're going to win the world. We have to reach the world one-on-one. -on -one. We have to get to people and preach Jesus to them. And we have to keep expanding that. And everybody keep doing that and keep sharing and keep doing, and keep ministering and keep witnessing. And sharing. There's going to be people who will never step into a, you know, or of course he's not here anymore, but to what, what, what was a Billy Graham, whoever becomes the next Billy Graham or, T.L. Osborne or Reinhardt Bonnke uh, in, the, in the earth, they're, you know, they're not going to reach the whole world. They're not going to have the entire world turn on the television set and watch their, um, their sermon. They're going to go to their out outdoor crusade and sit in the stands and receive Christ. There are people who, who wouldn't darken the doors of those places that we're going to have to get to. Preach Jesus to them. Make known the mystery of the gospel. And Paul said, you've got to pray for me that I be bold. Well, if Paul needed boldness, you need boldness. You need boldness, I need boldness. Amen? We all need that boldness. So, let's, let's begin to uh, implement that part of that, of, uh, of what Paul's saying in our life. You know, we, we love to put on the armor of God. I got the shield of faith. I got the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Hallelujah. Bring it on, devil. Why don't you go do what Jesus did? And I always loved uh, what, what happened with Jesus when um, John the Baptist was beheaded. And Jesus went off and withdrew himself. I mean, you know, the only person on the planet who even had an inkling of an idea who he was just got his head cut off because some harlot danced before Herod. And he got him all worked up and turned on and befuddled. He couldn't, he couldn't even think straight. And so I'll give you up to half the kingdom. His mom, her mama goes, tell me you want John the Baptist's head on a charger, on a platter. And he had said it publicly. He couldn't get out of it. Okay? And so Jesus withdrew himself, and the crowds followed him. Now, that was to crush him. That wasn't, you know, Satan inspired those crowds to go crush him in that moment of, you know, here, here's the only one who even knows who, who, who can even come close to understanding who I am. It says he got up and he healed the sick. He went and ministered in that hour of great distress on his own life and, and pressure. He, was, he went 
he responded to the Satan coming after him with going out and healing their sick and casting out devils. I think it's a beautiful, I just love that, that, that concept that he attacked Satan. He didn't go in there and bind him and throw him into the pit and, you know, and, you know, and all that, you know, everything we've done in, in, in church that's unscriptural as everything you can think of. I mean, if I, just, you know, I bind you, devil, I put you in the pit. You'll never, ever be able to do this again forever. The Bible says Satan left Jesus for a season. He came back. And if you, if, if you only depart from Jesus for a season, uh-huh, you ain't going to get rid of him. You know, the, the next time he won't be around for a thousand years is when he's in the pit. Okay? And then he's loose for a season, and then, then you know, and then he goes back um, to the second death. So our goal must become that we are bold even in, in adverse non-welcoming circumstances to preach Christ to get people saved and if you witness to a hundred people and get one saved you saved one huh yeah you, there's I love this that meme that someone puts on Facebook every once in a while it, it's got a bunch of guys names okay and in that list is Billy Sunday um, but people you'd never heard of. Billy Sunday's one, the one you would have heard of. But, you know, this person, this person, this person, this person, this person. And what it is is, and then the last person is Billy Graham. And what it was is the person before in the picture is the one that helped lead Billy Graham to the Lord, and the person before that led that guy to the Lord, and the person before that led him to the Lord, and the person before that, all the way back about seven or eight people. People that you'd never heard of, but they were all people that had ministries that were not big, were not exposed, never, you know, nation-changing, whatever, world-shaking ministries, except they did. Because later down the line, Billy Graham got saved, okay, and went and preached Jesus to millions. <clears throat> and people came to Jesus by millions over, his, over the life of his ministry. And it's all because of that trail. So the one may be another Billy Graham, or it might be the person who leads the person who leads the person who leads the person that leads the next Billy Graham. Who cares? God's got a plan. God wants you know to raise people up. Okay. So, um, praise the Lord. Well, that's going we're going to stop right there. All right. So we need to be praying. We're, and then we're going to move on to something next week. We're going to kind of call that the conclusion to our teaching on, on prayer and types of prayer and that kind of thing. Um, but that last thing being, let's pray for boldness. Okay that we'll open our mouth, speak boldly the mysteries of Christ, okay? We're ambassadors for him, and we speak as we ought to speak. He'll give us the right words, amen. Let's pray over this, uh, Penny. What's, what's her name? Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, Lord, we, we pray over this prayer call. We thank you. The word of God says that you wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. And as much as aprons and handkerchiefs were bought from him and taken from him and taken to the sick and laid upon them and the, the, the evil spirits went out of them and the diseases went out of them, they were made whole. Lord, we pray over this cloth right now for Emmanuel. Thank you, Father God, that this skin disease, this skin uh, ailment, we, we curse it in the name of Jesus. We command healthy skin on his scalp. We command that every aspect of his body uh, that, that produces the right uh, mixture of, you know, uh, moisture and oils and everything in his body and the, in his skin, we think that they work and function correctly. We think that there's no overproduction or underproduction of anything. We call every cell whole, every cell healed, every cell working the way you prescribe for it to work in the name of Jesus. And we curse this thing in him in the name of Jesus and command life to rule the life of God in Christ Jesus, rule in his body, make him whole. Amen. Amen. All right, Penny. All right. Well, praise God. Well, thank you all for joining us. Until we meet again, remember this. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. God bless you. We'll see you next time here at Faith and Victory Church.